I'd like to call this uh, this hearing to order. Uh, what? Someone has an echo. <laughs> All right, I'd like to call this uh, hearing of uh, Senate File uh, 4091 Conference Committee to order. Uh, members, we have a quorum, uh, and we are here to adopt the amendments to the various articles uh, within our bill and then uh, uh, make a motion to pass the bill uh, to the floor as amended. Um, we're going to go through this uh, in order, if there's no objection to that. And um, members, I will move the uh, um, amendment, uh, amendment S22-38 uh, for Article 1. I'm sorry, Articles 1 through 5, um, which comprises the jobs and, and labor provisions in the conference committee report, and uh, ask Mr. Mum uh, to walk through the uh, uh, financial, uh, fiscal, uh, Senate fiscal positions, and then we'll have Ms. Eng um, do the House fiscal provisions walkthrough of the appropriations. So, Mr. Mum. Uh, Mr. Chair, since uh, it's a committee report and there aren't House and Senate sides, uh, Ms. Eng and I decided that we would split it up by topic area and that uh, she would cover the jobs section of the bill. So she'll okay. be doing that through right now. Thank you. Ms. Eng, it's whenever you're ready. Hi, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Ashley Eng I'm from House Fiscal. Uh, I shared my screen, hopefully you could see it. We will begin on page three of the spreadsheet and line 100. Uh, this is to the Business and Community Development Division of DEED. On line 100, there is 4 million in fiscal year 2023 and 3 million in fiscal year 24 to Main Street Economic Revitalization Program. On line 105, there is 2 million in fiscal year 23 towards the Canadian Border County's Economic Relief Program. On line 109, there is 231,000 in fiscal year 23 and 1,560,000 ,000 in the tails to the Join Us Marketing Campaign. On line 112, there is 1 million in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to uh, the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Um, that it, there is 1 million in fiscal year 23 to Neighborhood Development Center. On line 114, there is 500,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to Enterprise Minnesota for their Small Business Growth Acceleration Program. And on line 115, there is 500,000 in fiscal year 23 to the Emerging Developer Program. Looking down at line 120, these are amendments to current law. On line 121, there is 1 million in fiscal year 23 and 2,360,000 in the tails to the business development competitive grant program for technical assistance to small businesses. And line 123, there is 1 million in fiscal year 23 and 2 million in the tails to launch Minnesota. And on line 125, there is 1,500,000 in fiscal year 23 and 2,500,000 in details to the redevelopment program. Now looking down at the employment and training program division of DEED on, on line 133, there is 350,000 as a base in fiscal year 24 and 350,025 to the immigrant and refugee workforce liaison. 
And on line 134, there is 400,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund for Team Teamworks. On line 136, there is 2 million in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund for the Youth Technology Competitive Grant Program. On line 137, there is 700,000 in fiscal year 23 towards adult tech training. On line 138, there is 1 million in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund um, to modernization. On line 141, there is 700,000 in fiscal year 23 to the Southwest Minnesota Workforce Scholarship. Um, and that's from the general fund. On line uh, 142, there is 400,000 from the Workforce Development Fund to hire. On line 143, there is 250,000 from the Workforce Development Fund to Hospitality Minnesota. On line 144, there is 500,000 from the Workforce Development Fund to Eastside Neighborhood Services. On line 145, there is 500,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to the Boys and Girls Club of Hibbing. On line 146, there is 950,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to Summit Academy OIC. On line 147, there is 500,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund for Minnesota Diversified Industries. On line 148, there is 200,000 from the Workforce Development Fund to Kaju. On line 149, there is 450,000 from the Workforce Development Fund to Mind the Gap. On line 150, there is 200,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to the International Institute of Minnesota. On line 151, there is 200,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to the Minnesota Council of Churches. On line 152, there is 100,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to Arrive Ministries. On line 153, there is 100,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund from, for Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Winona. On line 154, there is 1 million in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund for the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. And on line 155, there is 300,000 in fiscal year 23 from the Workforce Development Fund to the Urban League of Twin, the Twin Cities. And now looking down to the workforce jobs totals by fund, this is going to be line 190. Um, that section is the totals for the jobs. And so on line 191, the total appropriations in fiscal year 23 was 10,431,000 and 12,120,000 in the tails. Um, with the revenue of the 889,000 cancellation, the total um, general fund impact um, in fiscal year 23 was 9,442,000 in fiscal year 23 and 12,120,000 in the tails. And then the Workforce Development Fund total appropriations in fiscal year 23 totals 11,750,000. And that concludes the jobs portion. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Eng. Mr. Mum. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Eng uh, covered the, the uh, jobs portion. Um, did, did we walk through the Department of Labor articles yet or is, is that what's up next i think that's what's up next okay i will uh i will share my screen as well uh 
Um, beginning on line 204 is a $500,000 appropriation from the Workforce Development Fund for the Labor Education and Advancement Program grants or LEAP grants. Um, of this amount, 250,000 must uh, be awarded to community-based organizations and uh, 50,000 must is for administration of the program. Um, on line 210 is a $500,000 one-time appropriation from the general fund for the loggers safety program. On line 211 is a $200,000 appropriation from the general fund for a veterans liaison coordinator position. Uh, this has uh, uh, base amounts in fiscal 24 and 25 of 180,000 and $160,000. Um, on line 218 is a one-time uh, workforce development fund appropriation for the Abijas on the backside grant. Um, on line 219 and 220 are increases to the youth skills training program. Um, of the amounts, uh, 500 each year uh, in both uh, fiscal 23 and the tails is for um, the program itself and um, 108,000, 116,000, and 124,000 is for administration of the program. On line 226 is an increase uh, to the um, Department of Labor's uh, Combative Sports Division. It's a $150,000 a year increase from the general fund. Um, on line 240 and 241 are workers' compensation Court of Appeals appropriations. These are from the Workers' Compensation Fund. Um, there's a one-time appropriation for rulemaking, rulemaking related to the uh, campus initiative. That's 100,000 in fiscal 23. And then ongoing cost appropriations of $200,000 per year. Um, and that is it for the Department of Labor. The total spending is uh, general fund of $1.458 million in the current biennium and $1.88 million in the tails. The $300,000 and $400,000 of workers' compensation uh, fund spending for the, the uh, Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals. And then uh, just $750,000 one time from the Workforce Development Fund. And uh, that's the labor uh, portion of the appropriations article. Thank you, Mr. Mom. Um, are we going to start with uh, Ms. Doyle Fontaine on review of the bill, or are we going to go to uh, House? Go to Anna. For, okay, Ms. Shaleen, um, would you like to begin walking through the uh, through the bill? Chair and members, uh, yes, we'll begin with Article Three, Economic Development Policy, on page twenty-four, line nine, section one. This requires an annual report from DEED on legally mandated reports that no longer serve a useful purpose. Uh, turn to page 24, line 17, section 2. This language prioritizes high-wage, high-demand job training grants. Uh, further down the page, line 23, section 3. This is uh, creating the Immigrant and Refugee Affairs Liaison Effort to assist with the workforce integration of new Americans. Turning to page 27, starting on line 10, section 4, this language modifies eligible expenditures for funds appropriated for the Community Energy Transition Grants Program. Turning to page 28, line 1, section 5, this allows federally recognized tribes to participate in the Contamination Cleanup Program. Uh, further down, line 5, uh, section 6 through 8, these modify the pay for performance job training grant program to allow support services, require placements be for an average of 32 hours per week in order to uh, get an incentive, and limit repeat incentives for the same participant and require provision of a records on request. Uh, turning to page 29, starting on line 17, sections 9 through 10, these uh, add suburban county economic development associations as partner organizations for the Main Street Revitalization Program and require annual grant rounds for funds available after March 1st, 2022. Turning to page 31, starting on line 25, 
Section 11. Uh, this defines federal loan funds from the Department of Treasury as not being business subsidies. Turning to page 33, starting on line 11, section 12, this alters the language describing partners uh, in the Pathways Program to include private businesses, tribal-owned businesses, and municipal and county hospitals. Turning to page 34, starting on line 5, section 13, uh, this makes a technical change to the State Dislocated Worker Program. And on page 35, starting on line 18, section 14, uh, this language makes technical modifications to the definition of credential for the purposes of the Uniform Outcome Report Cards. Uh, for the rest of the section, we're going to go to Ms. Doyle-Fontaine. Thank you, Ms. Shaleen. Um, um, Mr. Chair, members, then beginning on page 36, line 1, section 15, this uh, would change the Uniform Outcome Report Cards to require a list of any grant recipients who did not satisfy all the reporting requirements. On page 37, line 9, section 16, this requires an annual report from deed to the legislature regarding unemployment insurance overpayments. On page 38, line 1, section 17, this moves the date for reporting on report on transferring the Launch Minnesota program to an entity outside state government up by a year to December 31st, 2023. Sections 18 to 22, starting on page 38, line 17. These sections extend dates and make technical changes to the forgivable loan program for remote recreational businesses this law that, to the law that passed in 2021. Section 23, page 39, beginning on line 24. These are two small technical changes to the recently passed unemployment insurance trust fund repayment law. On page 40, line 10, section 24, this adds a fraud prevention process to the recently passed frontline worker payment law. Section 25, page 40, starting on line 17. This would establish the Canadian Border County's Economic Relief Program to make grants to businesses adversely affected by the closures of the Canadian Border and the BWCA since 2020. Section 26 is on page 47 at line, 42 at line 7. This allows grant recipients of the Minnesota Investment Fund, Job Creation Fund, and Border-to-Border -border Broadband programs to incur eligible expenses for up to 90 days prior to an encumbrance being established in the accounting system. And finally, in this article, we have section 27, page 42, line 18. This would extend, extends the time to meet MIF and or the Minnesota Investment Fund and Job Creation Fund job requirements. Then we have, uh, we can go to Article 4. This is the Combative Sports Article. And this article makes technical changes to the combat Combative Sports Licensing. If you need more detail on the Combative Sports Article, uh, we can certainly answer those, try to answer those questions for you. <laughs> or the Department of Labor and Industry can answer those questions. So then I will move on to the Labor and Industry Pol Policy and Technical article that is, begins on page 53. The first section is on page 53, line 14, modifying the Labor Education Ad Advancement Grant Program to focus on listed groups. That's the LEAP grants. On page 53, line 29, section 2, modifies the State, bu state Building Code requirements for window cleaning safety by using the expedited rulemaking to insert a national standard into the code for window cleaning. Page 56, line 5, section 3. Reduce, this reduces building permit fees retroactively, and then it, that the retroactive fees are effective until October 1, 2023. Sections 4 to 6, starting on page 57, not line 11. Allow, allow work to be performed on conveyors, platform lifts, and other 
other than those carrying mobility impaired people and dock levelers without being a licensed elevator contractor. Uh, section seven and eight, these are the load control equipment inspection exemption provisions um, on page 58, line four. This exempts load control equipment from inspection, the inspection requirement under specific conditions. And finally, section nine, page 59, line 19, clarifies the effective date for, se for several of sections of the workers' compensation advisory bill that was passed earlier this, sec this session. And that is the uh, policy for economic development, labor, and combative sports, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Shalene. Thank you, Ms. Doyle Fontaine. Are there any questions or discussions on Articles 1 through 5 in Amendment S22-38? Okay. Seeing none, I'll renew my motion to adopt uh, SS22, Amendment SS2-38 um, into the uh, into the bill. We'll do a voice vote um, with each side, do, starting with the House. On the House side, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. That motion carries on the House. All those in, on the Senate, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries in the Senate. The motion is adopted. Uh, next, we'll go to Representative Long for the energy portions. Or I'm, I'm sorry, why don't we go to um, Senator, Senator Dames for the uh, uh, commerce portions. Senator Dames? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Pratt. I believe that that is the A4 amendment. Senator Dames moves the A4 amendment. And um, I believe we're going to have uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mum walk through and, and Ms. Ang walk through the uh, fiscal fiscal appropriations. Um, Ms. Mr. Chair, um, these are policy only articles. Um, okay. The commerce appropriations uh, are not being adopted uh, this evening. Thank Mr. you. Chair. I'm just reading my script and <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> Representative Stevens. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just. Uh, Chair Dames and I uh, have a, another bill that has the commerce appropriations. They're reflected on the spreadsheet. Okay. And they're accurate, but they won't be in this bill. They'll be in a, a separate bill. We just have a couple of uh, policy items that we elected to put in here just to keep us in the conversation. We didn't want to be totally left out. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, since since I seem to pick which fiscal staff is or uh, which nonpartisan staff is going to go first, I'll just ask if nonpartisan staff would like to walk us through the Article Six. Mr. Chair, members. Oh, I'm Laurie Sorry. Pump, and I would be happy to walk through these articles. Thank you. Feel free yes. whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm from House Research, um, and we're beginning at the top of Article Six. So Section One relates to remand benefit proposals and the system the legislature has for bills that propose adding the health mandate. Uh, the new language in this section requires the Commissioner of Commerce to provide the public at least 45 days notice when requesting information related to the review of one of these proposals. Uh, it also requires the Commissioner to alert the bill's authors um, when she'll be requesting information and requires that trade secret information be classified as so. On to sections two to six. These relate to dental provider contracts with dental organizations. Um, these sections require dental organizations to disclose to dentists certain information regarding fees, method of payment, and the leasing of dental networks. And finally, uh, section seven relates to homeowners associations. It requires an association that's levying a fine or an assessment against a unit owner to provide a written notice that includes information about the levy and assessment and the unit owner's options. Uh, and that's all we have for commerce policy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was having a side conversation. Is there additional discussion? Okay. Seeing none, any discussion on Article 6? Okay, seeing none, Senator Dames renews his motion to adopt the A4 amendment. Again, members, we will uh, do it 
by chamber, starting with the House, uh, House members. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries in the House on the Senate side. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries on the Senate. That motion is adopted. And Representative Long, I believe you have the uh, the energy move the energy provisions, the um, RS 122-11 amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that at this time. Thank you. Uh, Ms., uh, Representative Long moves uh, the RS 122-11 amendment. Um, Mr. Mum or Ms. Ng, whoever's going to start, please uh, feel free to begin when you're ready. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> I will uh, walk through the energy uh, spending in these articles. Um, uh, it's kind of scattered throughout, um, so this does the order of the spreadsheet doesn't reflect the uh, order that um, the, these items appear in the bill, but. Um, there, on line three, there is a $4.15 million appropriation for the Solar for Schools program. That's the, for the uh, uh, territory outside of the Excel service area. Um, and there's a base amount in fiscal year 24 of $3.8 million from the general fund. Um, on line six is the weatherization assistance program that uh, originated in the House bill. Um, it's funded at $2.35 million in fiscal year 23, five million, and with base amounts of $5 million in fiscal 24 and $9 million in fiscal year 25. On line nine is uh, $14.88 million for the um, uh, state competitive, competitiveness fund. This is money that will be used to uh, leverage um, federal uh, to, to match federal money available under the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was passed by the federal government um, last year. Um, the base amount for that in fiscal year 24 is $4.5 million. And there's a separate appropriation um, to uh, administer and provide technical assistance related to that, uh, the state competitiveness fund. That's $1.37 million in fiscal year 23 from the general fund. Um, the last general fund item is on line 32. It's a base amount in fiscal year 24 for the Community Energy Transition Grants Program. That's uh, run by the Department of Employment and Economic Development and is uh, to aid communities um, hosting uh, po power generating plants that will be going offline. Um, going down a little further to the renewable development account section, uh, these are all appropriations from the renewable development account. Um, in fiscal year 23, there is a $2.29 million appropriation for the Granite Falls hydropower uh, project. This is to cover cost overages um, that uh, were not met by the previous appropriation. Um, on line 68 is a $3 million appropriation for uh, a contingency fund um, that Excel Energy would use to remove solar panels from the Ford site development in St. Paul if it's determined that uh, the, the ground beneath those solar arrays is, is uh, polluted and contaminated and uh, needs to be remediated. Um, on line 74 is uh, an RDA component of the uh, state competitiveness fund. Uh, this would be for the same purposes as the general fund amount, but would be um, used to benefit um, uh, uh, projects in the Excel Energy uh, Electric Service area. On line 78 is a $3.5 million appropriation to install solar panels on the roof of the National Sports Center in Blaine. And on line 81 is another appropriation for the Community Energy Transition Grants Program. This is a three and a half million dollar appropriation in fiscal year 23, that is one time. Um, the total spending by fund for the energy and utilities area is $22.75 million in the current biennium. $23.8 million in the tails from the general fund. 
Um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I skipped over lines 87 and 88. Um, these are uh, amounts that Excel Energy um, gets to withhold from uh, their annual deposit into the renewable development account. The first uh, item on line uh, 88 is an $8 million amount that they can withhold in fiscal year 25 for the Solar for Schools program. Uh, this would serve customers within their uh, electric service area. And on line 89 is um, an extension of the Solar Rewards Incentive Program. Uh, it increases the amounts by 5 million each year in fiscal 24 and 25. And then not shown on the spreadsheet, but listed here is a $10 million withholding amount in fiscal year 26 as well. Um, and the total uh, spending uh, from the uh, renewal development account is 18.04 million in fiscal year 23. And then uh, the net impact uh, over the uh, next biennium is $18 million. And that's uh, it for the energy articles. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Mom. Any questions on the uh, energy spreadsheet before we move on? Okay, uh, then we will uh, go through, have nonpartisan go through the bill itself. And again, since I'll just let nonpartisan begin when they're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bob Eboff, House Research Department, going through Article 7. Section 1. Uh, concerns the Xcel Energy Solar uh, Rewards Program, which provides production incentives for owners of small solar arrays. As Mr. Mum just mentioned, it uh, uh, increases spending fiscal year 23 and 24 from 5 million to 10 million each year and extends that program to 2025 for 10 million. On page two is section two. It's is a uh, contingency account for solar energy um, Based on the uh, uh, former Ford site in St. Paul, it's to be used if the Pollution Control Agency decides to address contaminated land and to remove and remediate that land. And it's uh, contingency funds to be paid to the operator of a solar array who is, is uh, to be deposited on that land and would reimburse that owner for any changes in design or operations as a result of the PCA's work on that land. Section three at the top of page four and the following section, section four, deal with the uh, Community Energy Transition Grants Program, making uh, eligible uh, communities that are hosting plants whose operating license is going to set to expire within 15 years, and also allowing those grants to be um, made by the commissioner on a rolling basis. At the bottom of page four is section five, which changes the date for reporting of uh, Cold weather, uh, cold weather rule information. On page five, beginning with section six, uh, from section six through sections 14 on page 22, um, deals with a process of utilities commissions for utilities that are facing costs resulting from extraordinary events, such as storms which damage facilities or uh, a temporary uh, large increase in wholesale natural gas prices. This uh, uh, process allows companies to essentially to sell corporate bonds at lower rates of interest than they would ever otherwise be able to do to save customers over time as those costs are being repaid. And that takes us to page 22 in this section. Section 15 in the middle of the page um, regards the uh, sale of assets by utilities. Um, no P, no re approval from the Public Utilities Commission is required unless the sale of those assets is a million dollars or more. That threshold used to be 100,000. At the uh, bottom of page 22 is section 18. Um, this is language that allows the Public Utilities Commission and the Department of Commerce to assess utilities with respect to uh, the securitization costs or costs associated with securitization that I talked about uh, earlier. Article 17 and uh, going on to the next few pages to Article 20, 
our uh, section is dealing with uh, state supplementary grants for the weatherization program. That extends to page uh, 25, and at the bottom of that page is um, uh, a section that allows tribal contract schools to be eligible for the solar on schools program. On page 26, section 22, uh, this language allows Excel to withhold $8 million in 2024 from the renewable development account for the solar on schools program. And section 23, the state energy competitiveness account establishes an account that would be used to match federal funds uh, for it from energy grants and also provides legislative oversight over those grants. On page 28, in the middle of the page, are three sections dealing with the commercial PACE program, which expands those programs to include agricultural project, pro projects that uh, improve water and lands. Takes us to the bottom of page 30, section 27, just changes the reporting date on the telecommunications access program. At the top of page 31, section 28, requires um, a plan from Xcel Energy when it decommissions its Oak Park Heights coal plant. And section 29, in the middle of that page, requires the Department of Commerce to provide technical assistance to organize and operate a Tribal Advocacy Council on Energy from by the 11 federally recognized Indian tribes. And Mr. Chair, that takes us to page 32, which is the, uh, uh, the finance uh, information that Mr. Pimone just spoke of. So that's the end for Article 7. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Senator uh, Senjum and, and Representative Long I, um, for adopting uh, a portion on page 30, I believe it was page 30, um, uh, making sure that uh, when PACE loans are done, all the terms and conditions are, are included. I know this is, um, these are typically considered commercial, commercial projects, but I think it's good to have some sort of truth in lending. Um, Disclosure be available. So, is there any discussion on, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Swodzinski? Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt, uh, Chair Pratt. I have the A60 amendment. When would uh, be an appropriate time to offer that amendment? Uh, now would be an appropriate time to offer All the right, amendment. Sounds good. Well, I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Um, I move the A60 amendment before the uh, conference committee on jobs and energy, um, uh, and I would ask for a roll call, and I would like to explain the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Representative Swidzinski offers the A60 amendment. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, members. Um, you know, after uh, a long year uh, with high energy prices, um, we've seen small businesses, we've seen families um, really feel the effects of the increased cost of energy. And, you know, there are very few tools that the state of Minnesota can do uh, and as a Republican, one of the big things that we look at is taxation and the cost of doing business, the cost of raising families, the cost of living here in the state of Minnesota. And, you know, these programs that we have in this bill um, work to do certain things, um, and, but at the end of the day, uh, they use taxes that are on uh, levied on casts, which are the nuclear casts that are housed in Monticello and also in um, Prairie Island, near the Prairie Island community. And that equates to tens of millions of dollars um, that could be staying in the hands of families, in the hands of businesses, so that they could best utilize and compete in the economy that we have here in the state of Minnesota. And you know, one of the, the big issues that we have um, that we talked about, I know uh, Senator Senjum and I know uh, Representative Long uh, last year held uh, talks and, and, and committee hearings about the polar vortex and how that affected our businesses and how that affected um, members of the Chamber of Commerce and, the, and families and schools across the state. And one of the big issues that we heard was that, that huge spike in the cost. And 
when looking through this bill, there was nothing really to address those past costs and those real main increases. And rather than spend money on the future, right now, Minnesotans are hurting. Not at some future project, not at some future event. They're already hurting. And they're already hurting from what past policies uh, from the, the White House uh, to the governor's office. And uh, if you look at the amendment uh, on line 1.18, we establish an account. And that's uh, the Polar T Vortex Restitution Account. And we uh, put a, a majority, if not all, of the general fund spending in the energy bill into that account, which will be returned to uh, those payers of those rates so that we can buy down the cost of that energy so that that long-term push, which is continually increasing the, uh, the account, uh, the cost of energy will get put right back into their pocket so that they can help pay those bills down. And um, moving on to the amendment, and so that takes the aggregate amount requested by the public, public uh, utilities and municipal utilities under that paragraph. And then uh, in, at line 2.29, uh, appropriations of the Public Utilities Commission. And we take uh, those general fund dollars of $22,750,000 and appropriate to, that, uh, to the Utilities Commission to deposit in the Polar Vortex Restitution Account. Um, and that will help buy down the cost of um, that uh, the, the increase in costs for those uh, utility users. And then at 2.28, the Renewable de Development Account, uh, we take the dollars that are raised from ratepayers, from small businesses and families, to the increased cost of the cash storage. Um, as we all know, uh, the XL Energy does not pay those taxes, their ratepayers do. And uh, this um, moves those dollars where they need to um, and pushes it back right to the ratepayers as they pay it. Um, it was estimated that, you know, on average, that could potentially m impact a uh, restaurant here over $500. Uh, families, obviously a little less, depending on their energy uses, but if you're a manufacturer, quite a bit more. And so that's, uh, you know, a big part of the bill. And then, you know, one of the most important parts of this is, is really, you know, the importance of giving it back. We've heard a lot about how we want to give all of this money back to taxpayers and ratepayers. And at line uh, 3.6, I think is probably the most important part of this amendment. And uh, from 3.7 to 3.10, um, essentially we repeal that tax on that those casts in the state of Minnesota. And you know, I think uh, if uh, Mr. Eloff, would you just? I have a question for you. On average, or maybe fiscal staff would know. On average, how much does the uh, that fund generate per year? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Swinzinski, I think at this point it uh, is between 35 and $40 million a year. Yes. So, you know, as you see, by repealing that, um, you know, we're trying to do a lot of work on uh, Social Security. We're trying to do a lot of work on reducing the cost of, of, of living here in Minnesota. The cost of energy is exceptionally important to the folks that we represent. And by repealing this section over a 10-year period of time, it will mean over 40 or over 400 to 450 million dollars that stay in businesses' pocket, that stay in rate pickers' pocket, that stay in the people that we represent, not for our special projects, regardless of what they are, stay in the pockets of those who pay it. And I think that's one of the things that we need to take away from this session is saying when you go and we talk to folks out and about and they ask you, what did you do to lower the cost of my energy? This is something that we can be proud of, and this is something that we can do, and I would ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion on the A60 amendment? Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we did have some important discussion in our committee about uh, the costs around the polar vortex, both this year and last year, and we moved a bill out of our committee to help deal with this, which this looks a lot like. Uh, that bill was moved to the tax committee. And uh, that was because we did not have uh, money in our target to come anywhere close to meeting the needs. Uh, it was estimated that to, to actually show up as an impact to any individual ratepayer, we would need to put 300 million to 400 million uh, towards the bill, and that was not something that we had in our target. So we moved that to the tax committee, and there was just a tax uh, agreement announced tonight, uh, and this was not in it. It uh, certainly was something that they could consider, and that could have been a part of it. 
uh, the 300 or 400 million was not in the in the tax in the tax bill. Uh, so uh, that was certainly something that could have been a part of that that discussion. But there were other priorities for how to help reduce costs for Minnesotans, including rate cuts or child tax credits. Um, and so those will help with uh, affordability, including for uh, energy uh, affordability costs. Um, but this would delete the things in our bill that we are doing to help affordability, like uh, weatherization, which we know saves households hundreds of dollars per year, and that's on a permanent basis. So uh, I'd ask members to, to vote against this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Swadzinski. Uh, I, too, being from Greater Minnesota, want to see costs lowered. Um, can you tell me how you factored in the cost to Greater Minnesota and to the state of climate change if we move away from renewable energy, and how would those costs be expressed a year from now, five years from now, and ten years from now? And if you can, what you know, what dollar figure you see? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, uh, thank you, Senator France. Uh, you know, what, that was one of the interesting things that we heard about in committee. We heard bill after bill in the Energy Committee, and. I asked about every single testifier um, what that would mean to the environment if we passed any particular bill. And almost to a T, every person that testified said, well, it would be ineligible to not really making a difference. And the response to that oftentimes uh, was, well, we just need to do the right thing. And so from a, a factual reality, from a scientific standpoint, um, the state of Minnesota, when it moves those things forward, um, according to the experts, which I asked about every single person, to say what would that make a difference when it comes to the environment here in Minnesota um, by raising the cost of energy uh, for families, um, was approximately that answer. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Swadzinski. I'm not smart enough to know the science part, but watching some of the testimony that we prepared to have in the Senate Energy Committee, uh, climate-related storm damage paid by insurance companies is estimated now in the hundreds of billions. And so I do think there's a cost to Minnesotans, and I look forward to the discussion about how we can keep those costs down. Um, I wasn't there for those testifiers, but I look forward to hearing more. I'll be a no on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and, uh, and members and uh, Representative Swadzinski. Uh, you know, we, we come to the legislature uh, where it's, it's a place where ideas clash, and, and, and it's good. It's good to have these, uh, these conversations and, and to think about this. Uh, that said, uh, I know Chair Long and I have Certainly other members on the Senate Energy Committee and certainly Chair Long's Energy Committee have worked uh, five months uh, and uh, in more recent days, many hours to put a, a, a bill together that we thought, I think, has some degree of balance and, uh, and it's good in terms of moving Minnesota forward in, in this area. And so uh, notwithstanding this idea and this proposal, uh, and, and I, I understand it's, it's, it's just there, and, and it's, it's, it's certainly worthy of, of conversation and thought uh, another year. But uh, for this year, uh, I think that uh, we've worked hard. We've got a bill together. I think it's a, a good bill. It's got pretty good balance, I think, from the standpoint of general overall acceptance. And uh, I hope we can move forward with it, and I would recommend a no vote. Thank you, Senator Sengem. Uh, Representative Stevenson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I also don't support uh, this amendment. To begin with, it's a really bad deal for Minnesota uh, taxpayers uh, to adopt this amendment because one of the things it does is it deletes uh, the matching funds for the IIJA. Uh, those matching funds unlock $10, $10 federal dollars for every one state dollar that uh, we invest. And so we're leaving tens of millions of federal tax dollars on the table if you adopt this amendment. And that's not, I mean, that's money that Minnesotans are paying to the federal government too, right? So this is a bad deal. It's also more than, I, I just want members to know, it's not just deleting the, the fiscal components of the deal that Senator Senjim and uh, Representative Wong put together, but several, what I think are non-controversial policy items, including the provision that you, Chair Pratt, uh, praised a minute ago to the reform of the PACE programs would be deleted from this bill. It has no cost uh, if, if we adopted this amendment. So I, I don't think this amendment makes sense, and I'd ask for a no vote. Any other discussion on the amendment? Representative Swidzinski. Thank you. And, and just a response to uh, Representative Stevenson. You know, I think 
when when we do go out and we talk to constituents this fall, you know, one of the questions they're going to do is, you know, what what could you do with uh, the conversations we have about inflation? And you know, the, those dollars that are coming from the federal government that are that are focused that they're looking for state match, um, no one worked for that money; it was printed. And so, when you have folks that can't afford diapers, can't afford formula, can't afford to put gas in their car because the dollar is losing value. In real terms, people's purchasing power are going right down the toilet. Those dollars can build some things, absolutely, and they can match some dollars. But at some point, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't find a way to say to the federal government, stop printing money. We all have a role in that, and this is just a small step. Thank you. Members, just to remind you that uh, 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 this, this requires a, a, a majority on in each chamber separately to adopt uh, the amendment, as it's a House amendment on a roll call. We'll start with the House. Mr. Johnson will take the roll on the House, please. Representative Noor. No votes, no. Representative Eklund. No. Representative Long. No. Representative Stevenson. No. Representative Spadzinski. Yes. There being uh, one aye and four nays, the motion does not pass the House, therefore the motion cannot be adopted. Um, any other discussion or amendments to the A, the RS 122 11 amendment? Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Senju. Mr. Chair, I, uh, I, I want to acknowledge the work of, uh, of, of many people, but especially uh, uh, Carlin Doyle Fontaine uh, and, and the work that she and other collaborators did on putting together the, uh, the document that is going to uh, guide, if you will, legislative involvement in the IIJA uh, process. Uh, we didn't want to give that away to the administration. Uh, they crafted a, a very, very kind of technical and uh, threaded the needle in many cases to make this work for the legislature so that we uh, have a, a place at the table in, in these decisions relative to going forward, which projects go and which don't, and so on and so forth. That was not easy work. Many hours were spent in the last couple of days doing that. And so to, uh, to uh, Ms. Fontaine and to certainly others that worked on that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Any other discussion on the RS-122-11 amendment? Seeing none, Representative Long, will you renew your motion to uh, adopt the RS-122-11 amendment? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we'll start on the uh, House side. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The motion passes on the House. We'll do the Senate vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries in the Senate. The motion is adopted. Uh, members, we have uh, Senate File uh, 4091 as amended in front of us. Um, before I uh, motion that, uh, or before I take a motion uh, to move the bill, I you know I want to uh, thank all of our our nonpartisan staff and partisan staff. Uh, as well on this uh, on this bill, uh, Ms. Doyle Fontaine, Mr. Mum, uh, Ms. Elite, who uh, helps out with the job side, Mr. Lee um, on energy, Mr. Uh, Newberger on the on the commerce side. Um, it, you know, we we couldn't get this work done without you. And, and Mr. Johnson, thank you for being our uh, our uh, committee legislative assistant on this on this process and. I, I regretfully don't know the members of the House side uh, very well, but um, 
I, I've appreciated uh, their expertise and and um, and input along the way uh, in this bill. Um, I want to thank all of the testifiers we had uh, earlier in the week uh, who came and, and discussed this bill, the agencies and and their staff that not only uh, discussed the bill in, in, in committee, but helped us work through some, some very technical and um, detailed uh, provisions that are in the bill. And I'll uh, turn to Representative Eklund or Representative Knorr if they have any any questions, any comments to make before we take a motion? Go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Pratt. And uh, um, I, too, want to thank all of our nonpartisan staff, partisan staff. Uh, a job like this can't get done without you folks. It's as simple as that. We just, it, it that simple. The agency, thank you. The agencies, thank you. Uh, your staff has been tremendous helping us get through this process as well, and and uh, I look forward to talking about it on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Eklund. Uh, is Representative Nor Representative Nor, are you in line? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm online here. Thank you, Representative Nor. I'd ask if you would like to make the motion to adopt Senate File. Uh, uh, the, the conference committee report for Senate file 4091 um, as amended and, and be referred to um, be referred to uh, the floor. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Knorr. Uh, members, since this is a Senate file, we'll start. Uh, sorry, Ms. Doafonte. Okay. Uh, since this is a Senate file, we'll... Uh, uh, we'll start with the Senate side uh, and take a roll call. Uh, Mr. Johnson, will you take the roll on the Senate side? Chair Pratt. Aye. Senator Rarick. Aye. Senator Dames. Aye. Senator Senjum. Aye. Senator Friends. Aye. Okay. Representative Noor. No. Oh, wait, excuse Aye. Me. What's the... I was going to do the... Uh, Never mind. I was going to do the vote like we did last time, but go ahead. Representative Eklund? Aye. Representative Long? Aye. Representative Stevenson? Aye. Representative Swidzinski? No. Members, I was going to call the roll on each side first, but uh, Mr. Johnson got ahead of me. So. Uh, there being uh, five ayes and zero nays on this on the Senate, the bill uh, does pass the Senate. With there being four ayes and one nay in the House, uh, the, the motion does pass the House. Therefore, members, uh, the motion is adopted. Senate File uh, 4091, as amended, passes. Uh, Representative Eklund, um, may I ask that... Uh, where is it here? Hold on one second. I thought I had it right here. What are you looking for? The, um, the fixes. Oh, here we go. Uh, Representative Eklund, would you move that nonpartisan staff be authorized to make any technical changes necessary to reflect the will of the committee? Uh, that would be my motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative o um, Eklund moves that nonpartisan staff be authorized to make any technical changes necessary to reflect the will of the committee. Uh, we'll do a voice vote. Um, we'll start with the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes in the House on the Senate. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes the Senate. The motion is adopted. Members, the report will be emailed to all members of the conference. Uh, with the two CAs being copied. The email will include instructions telling members how to reply all with their name and district number to memorialize their adoption of the report. It's a good idea. Um, I also want to remind members um, that we, will that include uh, a physical signature, Ms. Elite? No, that will not include a physical signature. So we will be doing uh, signatures of the committee report on that, um, on that email. So watch... So watch your email so we can move along. 
Is there any other business that needs to come before the conference committee? Okay. Uh, seeing none, it, is, uh, it has been my pleasure to serve with all of you, and um, this committee will adjourn.